Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I picked up another one of these mini stereo audio amplifiers. The question, is it any good? Let's find out. So I picked up this new amplifier off of eBay. It cost me all of 20 bucks and there was not much included in the package. In fact, all that was in the box was just the amplifier itself, plus a very brief little instruction manual that was hardly in English at all. The reason why I bought this amp is, if you remember, I did a previous video about another little mini audio amp, but I was kind of lukewarm on that particular unit. There were some things about it that I didn't like, specifically that whenever it was receiving power, the Bluetooth function was always on. Basically, the power switch on that unit really only ever controlled the audio amplifier part. I modified that amplifier to actually have the entire thing be powered on and off through that switch, and it worked. But what I found was the output quality of that amp just wasn't very good. It distorted very easily. And even though I was only planning on using it just for music in the garage as part of a very simple audio setup, it just didn't sound very good. So I ended up recycling that thing and starting over scratch, figured I'll go find something else. And hey, I can share whatever I buy with you and we can find out together if the replacement is any good. So I ended up with this. There's really no major like brand name or model or anything on it. It says mini ample on the top. I don't know if they're too cheap to put the if fire on there. The bottom of the unit says it was designed by APPJ Audio. I'm not familiar with that, but who knows? I mean, the thing with buying these generic types of products off of eBay is it's like a lottery. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Obviously with the last one, I kind of lost. Maybe I'll get better luck with this one. Before we get too far into testing this thing out though, let's take the uh, very sage words of a fellow YouTuber. And before we turn it on, let's take it apart. Getting into this thing is a little bit of a question mark for me. There's obviously a seam here, but when you squeeze it, it doesn't really feel like those two parts want to easily come apart. So I don't think there's clips here. There's obviously nothing on the back. That's just the DC power socket and no screws on the bottom. So my gut's kind of telling me maybe you need to go in through the front panel here. Let's see what we can do. So yeah, the front panel just sticks on with some adhesive and don't worry, I didn't scratch it up. There's actually plastic film on the front to protect it. I'll peel that off when we're all done. And then underneath, some screws. And with any luck, they're just standard Phillips. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Oh, interesting. I was expecting a PCB across the bottom. It's just a two part design. Wow, that's, uh, that's surprising. Okay. Well. So let's start with this front panel. It looks like it handles all of the audio input stuff, plus the control over the amplifier itself. There's only these two connectors. This one has LGR, yo, hey, what up, Clint? <laughs> you getting a shout out, I guess, no. Left, ground, right. So that's gonna be audio output to the amplifier section in the back. And then this one is going to be, I'm guessing, control and power over the amp itself. So there's these labels here that say MG and then plus 5V. Plus 5 volts to actually power this board, ground, and then I'm not sure what the M in this case specifically stands for, but it's likely related to this dial on the front. Now, one thing interesting about this dial is it's not a standard 
like analog potentiometer. It's actually what they call a rotary encoder. It just continues to spin and spin and spin and spin. Plus you can click it in and out to make selections. So this is gonna send like a digital pulse every time you turn it or click it. And that's likely what that M pin is for. So instead of turning the volume up and down from the amplifier in an analog fashion, this thing is basically just telling the amp chip itself to raise and lower its own volume digitally. Um, they do have the colors kind of in a weird order here. Normally it goes green to yellow to red at the top if these are traditional VU meters. I guess we'll have to see what these do when you plug it in and turn it on. But uh, yeah, that's that front board. I kind of want to see what chips are going on. So let's take the screws out and, and look at the, uh, the circuitry itself. So yeah, as I suspected, this front panel board does all of the audio input for the entire amp. Three and a half millimeter analog audio in. There is the antenna for the Bluetooth. And because the casing is made out of plastic, that means they can go with an internal antenna. Plastic is relatively RF transparent. If you remember that previous amplifier that I tore down and modified, I'll include a link if you want to go check that out. That thing had a little external rubber ducky antenna because the casing was made out of metal. What I'm kind of surprised by is everything, all the audio routes through this single IC. It looks like this thing is just doing everything. It's taking analog audio from the three and a half millimeter jack. It's doing Bluetooth. The USB port on here is really interesting to see as well. And that is, I think this amp can work as a DAC if you plug it into a computer. We'll test that a little bit later on here. But if that's the case, that leads to some very interesting opportunities for some people, especially if it all just goes through this one chip and it's, you know, as simple as that. So it's a very easy kind of clean design here. There's not much going on on the back, just this one filter cap. Um, what I also like to see here is all of these connectors are on these weird little right angle boards. But again, that makes sense. It simplifies the PCB design. Plus, if you ever have to replace one of these jacks, it's gonna be not too difficult to do so. If you wear out the three and a half millimeter or break the USB or whatever, it's a reasonably modular design. Go in and fix it and upgrade it and modify it later on if you feel like it. So let's get this front panel board out of the way and start focusing on this amplifier section. It's buried down in there with four screws. It looks like those four screws correspond to the binding posts. Let's uh, try taking them out and see what we get. So that's really clever with the screws. You'll notice on the PCB here, those screw holes are actually pads. Same thing on the opposite side. Those screws are actually what completes the electrical connection between this PCB and the banana jacks on the back of the case. So you don't have to take the banana jacks out and they don't have to solder them directly to this PCB. That makes for really easy assembly on their part. That's that's quite surprising. Um, I'm seeing a lot of signs that they were kind of thinking ahead with this design and not just slapping a bunch of random parts together. A couple of really big caps on here. Not else, much else going on uh, on this side, just the two cable inputs from the front panel. This side looks to be where a whole lot of the amplification stuff is going on, but there's not a whole lot of hardware to do it actually. Just the, uh, the, four, the four coils there. And I'm guessing under that little bitty heat sink is the amp chip. So unfortunately, while it's great to see this heat sink even on here that they bothered to do that, they stuck it down to the amp chip using thermal adhesive instead of thermal paste. I've been trying to kind of pry this thing off delicately and it's it's not going anywhere. That adhesive is too strong. If I put brute force into it, I could remove 
the heat sink and I might be able to scrape enough of the adhesive off to get some of the numbers off the top of the chip, which is really what I'm interested in. But at the same time, I want to not only test this amp to see if it's any good, but hopefully also use it if it is good. So I don't really want to destroy it quite in the name of science if I can help it. One thing that does knock this unit down a little bit of a peg is check out these pins on these caps. Like they couldn't get in there and trim them down a little bit. The rest of the amp seems to be constructed like half decently, but they couldn't do that. Now, in terms of power, this thing claims to be 50 watts times two. And that's going to be one of the numbers that um, is going to vary, let's just say, depending on how you use the amp and specifically how you feed power into the amp and then what kind of speakers you hook up to the amp. Uh, this thing will accept an input voltage range of anywhere between 9 and 24 volts DC, which is very typical. And in general, if you look at the data sheets for amplifier chips, basically the, the higher voltage and the more current the power supply you hook up to it is able to deliver, the better the amp chip will perform. If you've got a, a good power supply laying around, if you know what you're doing, and you are able to feed this thing all of the current that it wants, yeah, right side up, then it may work out okay. What I ended up doing was digging out an old laptop power supply. The power supply that I've got to use with this thing can output something like just a bit over 50 watts. This thing is rated for 50 watts times two. I don't think I'm ever gonna hook up speakers that will require that kind of power, nor will I ever drive the speakers that I hook up to this thing loud enough to need that kind of power. Um, and in general, I don't think too many people are going to expect a tiny little amplifier like this to be able to drive giant inefficient speakers. So 50 watts input into this thing, I think is gonna be fairly reasonable. Stick the front panel back on here. I did mark up the plastic, that silver trim a little bit, which is kind of a bummer, but this thing's gonna live in the garage if it does work. So it'll, it's the least of its worries. So, you know, if you use it with small speakers and give it a decent power supply, I kind of suspect a lot of these little mini amps will work decently. The question is, how do they sound? And then what's the overall user experience with them like? Let's hook this thing up now and find out. I've got a variety of speakers that I could test these with. Some of them are relatively easy to drive. Um, things like my JBL Control One Plus models. They don't require a whole ton of power. They're relatively efficient little speakers. Yeah, I mean, that's probably indicative of what most people would use with an amplifier like this. Just little near field monitor type of situation. But at the same time, that I don't think is a very good test of the amp chip inside this unit. Because it was only when driving less efficient speakers, specifically the ones that I plan on using with this amplifier in the long term in my garage, that I noticed on that previous amplifier, it didn't sound very good. So instead of softballing it with this thing and giving it an easy to drive set of speakers, we're going to pick it up a notch and go straight to the big boys. If you remember these from a previous video, these are a set of commercial Bose 102s that have been modified from running on a 70 volt constant level system to regular, I think they measured in at about six ohms. I also added a small filter network inside these to fix in quotation marks the EQ output because they are just a single full range driver. There is no separate tweeter. But for this test, they're actually a really good option because these are super freaking inefficient speakers. Uh, they were inefficient to begin with and they're even more inefficient now 
that they've got that extra filter network and they've been converted to a regular impedance and blah, 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 blah. So I figured, you know what, let's give that amp an exercise on these guys. And if you haven't watched the video for these, go ahead and, and check it out. It was an interesting audio engineering experience. So plugging in the power gets you one LED on the front. What does the phone say? I am not seeing it showing up in the list with just power applied. Okay, so far so good. Let's uh, turn this thing on. And I think you do that by pressing and holding. Yep, okay. The second red LED comes on when it's turned on. And then now I've got the Bluetooth light blinking. Okay, and there it is. Mini damp. What's with the name on this thing? It doesn't even match the mini ample on the top. Anyway, um, so it shows up only when powered on. Let's connect. Ooh, quick little pop out of the speakers as soon as it paired. Not loud by any means, but uh, I didn't really like that. Anyway, blue lights on. Looks like we're paired. Um, no visual feedback when you change the volume. Okay, so that's clearly the bottom. When you turn it all the way down to nothing, the orange, whatever, yellow lights turn on to let you know you're at zero. But as you turn it up, there's no indication like where you are in the range. That's kind of a bummer. Let's turn it all the way down to zero and, uh, I don't know, maybe play some music? Oh, what is that? What? VU meters are going. I've got the music playing, but it's not actually outputting any audio. Just that noise. Except when it's all the way down to zero. Anything above zero. Ooh. Um, let me check my connections real quick. Okay, so I took it apart just to check everything. Check this out. Yeah, that's no good. Um, I'm guessing it's just some kind of loose connection inside here. I don't know if it's a bad solder joint or the, uh, like these connectors themselves or what. Yeah, okay. So that's going to be something to consider with this amplifier, I guess, is uh, maybe the build quality is a little sketchier than I was anticipating. Well, let me see if I can't get this bu thing buttoned up like for good and reliable, and then we can do some real audio tests with it. Let's play a track and see, one, if it at least sounds halfway decent, and two, kind of what max volume ends up being like. I realize playing audio through speakers on YouTube is stupid. I mean, it's only going to sound as good as the microphones in whatever I'm recording with and the speakers or headphones you're listening on, but in the very least, we can kind of tell if there's any obvious distortion. And then I'm just curious as to, like, does this thing even get loud driving these super inefficient speakers or what? We'll see how this thing performs. It looks like the VU meter on the front doesn't really relate to the audio output level, it's just whatever it's getting in. So that's max volume. You can see it turns the orange light solid for a second when you hit the top. But I can tell you this, from where I'm sitting and knowing that it's these speakers and they're not very efficient, 
This little lamp is pretty damn loud. I think it'll totally work for what I need it to do in the garage. So there's one other thing I want to test, and it's this little USB port on the front. The blue light on the front is lit up, and when I plug the cable into the computer, it detected a new device. Let's see if it does what I think it's going to do. Okay, so let's wrap this thing up. This unit definitely has some pros and cons. Two things I'm concerned about. First is, of course, what was with that noise when I first powered it on? Yeah, granted, I had taken it apart and put it back together, but still, even when I had it half apart, you saw I was just barely touching the front panel and it was making all sorts of crazy scratchy noises and everything. So maybe the electronic build quality isn't quite as good as what I was hoping. The other thing I'm a little bit concerned about is the amplifier section. We saw that there's a small heat sink on the amp chip in the back. The problem is the casing on this thing is made out of plastic and it's otherwise sealed. So there's really no airflow going through this. Is that little heat sink inside a sealed plastic case going to be enough to keep that chip cool over the long term? That's hard to say. Granted, I don't think very many people are going to be using a unit like this full blast for long periods of time. So while that could technically be an issue with overheating, maybe for the majority of people, it just won't matter. It's kind of hard to say and time will tell. I'll definitely be running this thing through some more tests. But otherwise, there's a lot to like about this unit. It's compact, it's physically pretty well built, like it doesn't feel cheap at all. The power output on this thing is fairly impressive. Yeah, it says 50 watts times two, and I don't know if that's right or not, but powering those relatively inefficient speakers, it got to a pretty decent level, and it sounded good the entire time. I couldn't pick up any distortion. The other thing I really like about it is the usability. I like that it keeps the Bluetooth turned off unless you actually turn the amplifier on. I like that it has multiple inputs and it tells you which one it's using based on the light on the front. I like the fact that it also has this USB port on the front, and that may be the killer feature for some people. The use case that comes to mind for me with that USB port is actually the Raspberry Pi. Those modules are famous or infamous for having relatively dirty, not very good analog audio output. But a lot of people like to use them for audio setups or use audio through them like with a RetroPie setup. This could make a really good piece in a kit like that or a project because, well, you can bypass that ugly analog audio and just go straight into the USB DAC. If you want one of your own, my only advice is to search on eBay. There's just random sellers selling these and no doubt if I put a link in the description, it'll stop working pretty quickly because that's eBay. But anyway, just search around if you want one of these. I approve. If you liked the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.